Welcome back students. In this lecture we're going to talk about some performance issues when working with remote databases. We're going to talk about why it's such an issue. I'll show you the results of some tests I did between A2 Hosting and AccuGIS as well to help you decide which will be the best for your needs. And I'll talk about some other considerations that you should think about when you're choosing a hosting platform. Because data transfer speed is the bottleneck in most GIS deployments. GIS data tends to be large, especially lines and polygons or large detailed rasters. It's not uncommon for some GIS data sets to be several gigabytes in size. And if you try to move that much data over an internet connection, you'll probably bring it to its knees. To put this in perspective, data transfer rates of local disk drives range from 50 to 2000 megabits per second. The low end might be an external mechanical drive over a USB 2.0 connection. USB 3.0 technically can handle throughput up to 300 megabits per second. An internal hard drive would be even faster than that. And the high end would be a fast solid state drive. So even if you're working locally on a single computer, you can greatly increase GIS performance by several orders of magnitude by moving your data to a solid state drive. And I would argue that this is the most bang for your buck when choosing a GIS computer. The exception would be if you do a lot of large raster processing. In that case, you might be better off increasing the amount of memory so that the raster can be held completely in memory and not deal with the disk at all. But it won't help us to store our database locally because the whole point is to have it accessible by multiple users. So in that case, the next fastest way to access the data is over a cabled local area network which can often handle speeds up to a thousand megabits a second, or a gigabit. And that can actually be faster than a slow hard drive, but it will almost certainly be slower than a local solid state drive. Still, it can be quite fast. But to do this, you'll need to set up PostGIS on your own server, and that can be a bit of a hassle. If you want people from outside your organization to have access to your data, you have to have your database set up outside your company's firewall, and often this means on a remote server that is accessed by the internet. Internet speeds vary considerably from 1 megabit per second or less on a slow cellular or Wi-Fi connection to much, much faster. I recently saw one advertisement for internet access at 4,000 megabits per second, which is faster even than a local solid state drive. Currently, 4G cellular data speeds have a theoretical maximum of around 100 megabits per second, but I've never actually seen to be faster than 20 megabits per second. But that in itself is impressive for many things although it's lacking a little bit for serving GIS size data sets. I was recently teaching a GIS course in a remote part of Africa, and the people there did not have an electric grid at all. The university was run off of generators, but they had cell towers delivering internet at 15 megabits per second. And that's a life-altering change for people, but it would still struggle a little bit if it was loading a lot of GIS data from a remote server. But 5G cellular is coming soon with a theoretical maximum of 20 gigabits per second. And even if the reality only pans out to be one-tenth of that, it would still be comparable to local solid-state drive speeds. Of course, you need to be near a cell tower for that. But satellite internet access is available from just about anywhere with speeds up to 25 megabits per second. So the possibility of connecting to a post-GIS database from even very remote areas exists over a satellite connection. But fortunately, most of us are not in very remote areas. Most current Wi-Fi routers are limited to speeds of about 54 megabits per second. But the latest protocols offer the possibility of speeds up to a gigabit. And much faster speeds over wireless connections are also expected to be available in a few years. With that in mind, the ability to get internet access at speeds up to 1 gigabit per second over a cable network connection are less impressive than they were a few years ago, but that's probably still the fastest and least expensive option today. It might not be in three or four years as hardware catches up to the technological possibilities, but if you can get true one gigabit speed over a cable connection, it will make the remainder of this lecture almost pointless. But before you run out and spend a lot of money on one gigabit per second internet service, it's important to remember that internet speed is dependent on what's happening on both sides of the connection. 1 gigabit download speeds won't help you a bit if the server on the other end is only able to upload your data at 20 megabits. No matter how advanced the technology gets, you'll never be able to download data faster than it is able to be uploaded on the other end. And if your data is stored on a shared hosting service, such as the examples that we've seen in this course, you'll probably never actually get close to what is theoretically possible. 
because you're sharing that connection with many other users. And if all of them are using it at the same time, it may be very slow indeed. So for this and many other reasons, although blazing fast internet connections do seem to be coming in the near future, it's probably safe to assume that it will be several years before all that speed trickles down to end user products on both the client and the server sides. And you can expect your remote server to be considerably slower than a local drive or even a local network server. And that's unfortunate because you've just spent a fair amount of money moving your data to a remote server so it can be accessed from anywhere. And you're excited to join the world of high technology only to find that you've taken a performance hit. But don't get too upset because there are steps that we can take to mitigate this and still achieve pretty decent performance. But first let's take a look at some actual performance of our sample data set on some different servers as raw data to get a feel for what kinds of performance hits we're talking about. Our sample data is certainly not huge by big data standards, but it's pretty good size for the work I've done throughout my career in the environmental consulting field. It represents the cumulative work of half a dozen field personnel over five or six years. So let's go to QGIS and what I did was set up a project where I have data from a remote server, in this case on AccuGIS, and the same exact data on localhost. And I put them in groups so I can turn them on and off individually. And so we have the local host data showing right now. And you'll notice right now I'm at 1 to 10,000 scale. If I go to 1 to 50,000 scale, the refresh is almost instantaneous. And same thing, you know, if I go all the way out to 500,000 scale, the refresh again is almost instantaneous. And this computer that I'm running it on is certainly not a powerhouse by today's standards. It doesn't have the fastest processor, and it's only got like 8 gigabytes of memory, but it does have a fast solid state drive. And so it's able to get data from the PostGIS database on localhost very quickly. Now on our remote server, if I turn off the display of everything on localhost and turn it off from our remote server, see, it takes a second or two to display even at 1 to 10,000 scale. And if I zoom out to 50,000 scale, It'll take about 30 seconds to actually display all this data. And that's not good. 30 seconds is a long time to wait for a page refresh in GIS. You can see it's still oh, there, it just finally stopped. So it has got all the data, but anything you do, even if you just zoom, it's going to take 30 seconds to redraw. And trust me, that's enough to drive you absolutely up the wall. So I wanted to do some testing between the two different remote database services that I use, A2 and AccuGIS, to see if there was a difference in performance. And I used the same basic test, how fast it takes to zoom out from 1 to 10,000 to 1 to 50,000 scale. And the results of those tests were, I thought, were really interesting, but probably not a big enough difference to inform a whole lot on the decision of whether to use one over the other. So let's go look at the results of those tests and then we'll talk about some other considerations that you might use when you're deciding on a remote database host. So what I did was measure how long it took to perform a specific task under various conditions. I did my first five runs in my reception area where I was only a few feet away from our wireless router. And we pay for 50 megabits per second service, but in reality what we get varies considerably throughout the day and depending on where we are in the building. So before each series of tests, I tested the current download speed using a website called speedtest.net. If download speeds are the bottleneck, then you would expect the times to vary with measured download speeds. Then for each web hosting service, I timed how long it took to zoom from 1 to 10,000 scale to 1 to 50,000 scale. This means the map view would cover an area five times as long and five times as high and theoretically return 25 times as much data which would take a long time to redraw. As you saw on localhost, this time was negligible. It was almost instantaneous, so this tells me that the bottleneck is not in QGIS, or even in PostGIS, because both have the ability to serve and display this amount of data very quickly. The difference in speed has to come from something that is different on the server. I also alternated which servers I timed first after measuring the download speeds to rule out that there wasn't something systematic in the order that they were tested. 
Now I know that my internet speed is significantly lower in my office, which is 20 meters away from our reception area where the router is, and has two walls for the Wi-Fi signal to go through. So I was curious how much that would affect performance, and so I did another five runs with the exact same protocol. The only difference was that I was further away, and my measured download speeds were only half what they were right beside the router. And I was actually fascinated and a bit surprised by the results. The times for each host were remarkably consistent. Even when I moved to the office and cut the download speed in half, it didn't really seem to make any difference in the redraw speeds. And this suggests that the limiting factor in this case is not download speeds, but either the ability of the server to process the request and upload them, or something else was happening in between the server and my router. And while A2 hosting was consistently faster and this difference was statistically significant, the difference was also relatively small. It doesn't probably make much difference to the user if they have to wait 28 seconds or 31 seconds for a redraw. That's still just too much time. So in the next lecture, I'm going to talk about some things that we can do to improve performance that aren't dependent on download speed. And there's a few tricks that we can do. But before that, I want to talk about some other considerations that we might use to choose between A2 hosting or AccuGIS or some other hosting service that you might want to consider. So A2 hosting has a variety of hosting options. You can get your own dedicated server even if you want. And most of those options include things like more memory or more processor cores dedicated to your service. And almost all except for the very cheapest options have unlimited storage and unlimited bandwidth. Now AccuGIS on the other hand doesn't have unlimited storage and bandwidth. And for the lower price plans, what you're paying for as you go up is not more memory or more processing cores, but that they allow more storage and more data transfer. Now they do have some plans if you look at like the GeoNode hosting plans, where you can pay for more memory and more CPU cores. Those plans get pretty expensive. So in terms of raw speed, A2 hosting has an advantage. AccuGIS was a little bit slower in the testing that I did. However, the difference was not very large. And so, to me, I would say that A2 hosting is great for web hosting if your main purpose for using PostGIS is to be able to access it from a website. A2 hosting would be a good option for that. But don't expect them to know anything about GIS. They're a big company. The people who use their hosting services for PostgreSQL, and in particular for PostGIS, are a relatively small part of their business, I think. Where AccuGIS, on the other hand, is great for spatial applications such as GeoServer or GeoNode because their main focus is GIS. So if you think you're going to want to use GeoServer or GeoNode at some point, you should definitely consider AccuGIS, even if you just want to learn more about it and learn how it works. And so this brings us to customer support. And I've used A2 hosting for a couple years. Most of the time, everything works great. When I have had to use the customer support, I'll admit it's been a little frustrating. They're a big company. I'm sure they get a lot of support requests. And so in their support system, I think they have several levels of support. And the first people you talk to are the people who are just triaging your support, trying to figure out who to get it to to actually answer your questions. And then you can move up to a couple layers and get to somebody who actually knows what you're talking about. Because most of the questions they get are probably easily answered. But I've had pretty often where they just point me to some documentation that they have on their website. And then I have to go back and say, yeah, I've read that. I did exactly what it said, and then you pointed me back to the article, and they say, oh, well, we're sorry, and then you get somebody else, and they actually know what they're talking about, or maybe you have to go up to another level before you get to somebody who actually knows what they're talking about. And each time it takes, you know, seven or eight hours to get a response, so you can waste a lot of time before you actually get an answer. And so while it might be possible to set up a Java servlet on A2 hosting, to run GeoServer, or to run Python on the server so you could run GeoNode. Just the thought of even trying to do that and get answers on how to do that through A2 hosting is kind of daunting to me. And I'm new to AccuGIS, and I haven't had to use their customer support. And part of the reason for that is that they have everything set up for PostGIS and, and GIS databases. And all the answers that I had are right there in the documentation. They make it really easy. I would expect if I actually had to call them for support, they probably have a better experience because they're a smaller company, and they are focused on GIS. So if you have GIS-specific questions, you'll probably be able to talk to somebody who knows exactly what you're talking about. But again, I haven't used their support much, so I can't promise you that that's going to be your experience, but that would be my expectation.
So those are some things to consider. In the next lecture, we'll talk about some tricks that we can do to actually get some improved performance of our GIS data in QGIS when we're working with the remote database. Thanks for listening. This was just one lecture in an entire course on spatial databases focused on PostGIS and QGIS. And this course is available now on udemy.com. It has more than 70 lectures and 11 hours of content. And I'm adding more content all the time. And you can get it now for only $20 with the coupon code COURSE5. And if you're interested, you're also welcome to check out my other courses on WebGIS and QGIS. And you can get more information on those at the following location. Or you can just Google Geospatial Brainstorming Courses. And it should take you right to this site.